Hi everyone, I'm McKenna Jordan. I'm the owner of Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas. And we are so excited to be bringing you a slightly different virtual event today. Many people don't know that we actually do have children's, young adults, board books, all sorts of young readers, um, mysteries, biblio, um, books, things about books and the love of books um, in the store. People don't know that we have those. They come in all the time and they go, do you have kids books? And we go, yes, of course we do. We have Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys and a million things in between. Obviously, the more recent um, thrillers as well. So I'm very excited today to be um, hosting these three ladies as they talk about their um, new young adult releases. Um, just a couple things. So as I said, we have we have kids books, but we also are open. Some people don't know that. We've been open since October. You're welcome to come in and browse. Um, we're there Monday through Saturday, 10 to 6. Also, we have a ton of these virtual events we're doing, and it's so great to be able to reach new um, viewers all over the world. So make sure to check out our events page at murderbooks.com. We're going to be back this evening um, for a historical um, fiction event with Simon Turney and Gordon Doherty, interviewed by Kate Quinn. So that'll actually just be in two hours. We'll be back at 5 Central for that. Um, if you have any questions, please, please, please put them in the comments. Don't be shy. We'll get to them in the second half of um, this interview. Um, if you're on YouTube, you can put those in the live chat and um, just pop them in the comments here on Facebook. Okay, so that's enough of um, bureaucracy. Let's go ahead and get the authors introduced. Our first author I'm going to bring on here is Natasha Preston. Hi, Natasha. Hi. Thanks for being here today. Um, Natasha Preston is the New York number one New York Times bestselling author of The Cellar, The Cabin, Awake, You Will Be Mine, The Last, and her latest, The Twin. That's a lie because your latest is The Lake. Like uh, <laughs> a UK native, she discovered her love of writing when she shared a story online and hasn't looked back. She enjoys writing romance, thrillers, gritty YA, and the occasional serial killer thriller. So thanks again for being here. Thank you. All right, next up is Holly Jackson. Hi, Holly. Hi, thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. So um, Holly Jackson is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. She started writing stories at a young age, completing her first attempt at a novel when she was 15. You say poor attempt, but I'm I'm gonna argue. <laughs> yeah, I always think when people are reading my bio, everyone's gonna think you're sassing me because it was me writing it about myself. So <laughs> that's why I omitted it. I was like, I'm not I gonna like judge that. judge her first book. <laughs> and she graduated from the University of Nottingham, where she studied literary, linguistics, and creative writing with a master's degree in English. She enjoys playing video games and watching true crime documentaries, so she can pretend to be a detective. And she lives in London. Today, she's here to discuss. Good girl, bad blood. And again, thanks so much for joining us. Yay. Thank you so much. For, I've come prepared books next to me. Excellent, excellent. You hold those up all you want. And before I introduce our guest moderator, I will mention that I have just dropped a link in the chat on both platforms. So there's a link um, to purchase any of the author's books. Just click there and we would appreciate you considering getting some from us. And um, so we have a special guest moderator interviewer today, which always makes my life easy. And we're so appreciate, pre appreciative of that. We're going to be joined by Karen McManus. Hi, Karen. Hi. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So uh, Karen M. McManus earned her BA in English from the College of the Holy Cross and her MA in journalism from Northeastern University. She's the number one New York Times bestselling author of One of Us is Lying. Two Can Keep a Secret, One of Us is Next, and The Cousins. Her work has been published in more than 40 languages. All right, so now is the time when I'm going to go away. I'm going to sit back and enjoy the talk. And whenever you're ready for me to come back on for questions, just say the word and I'll be back. Y'all have fun. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. All right, hi, guys. Hi. hi. And hi, everyone joining us. Um, we're so glad you're here. So we are here because these two brilliant thriller queens have recently released some new books. So first of all, can you tell us a little bit about your latest? So Natasha, maybe we can start with you. What is The Lake about? So it's a summer camp in Texas and these two girls, they go back, they've been there as children, they return as counselors in training 
um, and they are going back with a deep dark secret, something that happened there in the past and someone's out for revenge. I love a good summer camp book. So <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy that that was the setting that is 100% my jam. Holly, what about you? Oh, so my book that came out this week is Good Girl, Bad Blood, which is the sequel to A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. Um, so after all the tomfoolery and murdering going on in the first mm -hmm. book, um, the main character, Pip, has sworn off her detective days. She's just going to be a normal teenager. Um, but she's running a, a true crime podcast to cover the case that she solved in book one. Um, but her plans to give up her detective life go awry when uh, someone close to her goes missing and the police won't do anything about it. So she kind of has to go back on her promise and get back into her detective shoes. Um, and because she's running it for a podcast, this time everyone is listening to every twist and turn that she works out in another small town mystery. So, yeah, more mystery, more murder, all that good stuff. Well, I've read both of these. They are total nail biters. So for those of you in the audience who haven't picked them up yet, you are definitely going to want to read them and be shocked and surprised like I was. Um, so let me ask you guys how you kind of got into this genre of young adult mysteries. What was your writerly path? And Holly, maybe we can start with you. Uh, so interestingly, I kind of, my, the first book I wrote was like a historical like crime fiction kind of like about a thief a thief that's a hard word to say in like a in like 16th century london so it was really different and it was an adult book and i sent it out to agents and i kind of got a few good responses but like everyone was like oh we can't really sell this this, this isn't really a genre um and then i was kind of in conversation with my now agent and he was like what what ideas do you have? And I was like, oh, I was kind of thinking of like a kind of high school set murder mystery type thing, because at, at that point, the Karen McManus hadn't come out with her one of us <laughs> yet. And so everyone was like, is that a thing? Young, young and out thrillers are It was aren't not me? a thing. <laughs> no, and so I was like, should we do that? And he was like, why don't you give that a shot? Um, so then I kind of went away and I wrote that book, the, this book, in fact, quite quickly, because when you're sending out to agents, I was a bit scared, like, oh, he's going to forget me if I don't do it really quickly. So I wrote it in about, I think, like 10, 11 weeks. Like, I didn't get a lot of sleep and sent it back to him quickly before he forgot about me. And then whilst we were waiting to go on submission, Karen McManus very um, graciously came out with One of Us is Lying and created a bit of a moment with everyone being like, oh, we, we want young adult mystery thrillers. Yes, please. So um, thanks, Karen, for your good timing there. And that's kind of how um, how I ended up in this genre. Although I feel like I was always kind of destined to end up in this genre. That previous book was a bit of a hiccup. I think I'm kind of naturally a, a murder crime writer. So I found my place eventually. Yeah, you've got the true crime background, right? Always, always in the background. Yes, I came yeah. back to my roots. <laughs> and how about you, Natasha? So. I kind of really like murder and <laughs> that was kind of the only thing I really wanted to write sort of early on and I like putting teens in danger. <laughs> you know, I, I <laughs> <laughs> Fictional <laughs> danger. <laughs> yeah I mean some of their reactions I think about how I would react when I was 16 and someone was like chasing me and and so I was always really interested in that and kidnapped. So I started writing on Wattpad, just uploading a chapter at a time. And, and I found I really, really enjoyed it because before then, I mean, I'd never written anything. I didn't, I never even knew like I wanted to write. So I was writing a bit on there and I decided that I really, really loved like the thriller. Um, but I'd only really read adult ones. So I was like, okay, well, we'll just go. We'll kidnap some girls, we'll put them in a cellar We'll upload it and I got a lot of really good responses on Wattpad and that's where my publisher found me. So then I kind of just continued and I like the murder. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I was going to ask you guys too because like you both sort of mentioned, you know, just like being intrigued at not just the crime but kind of the high school setting, right? Um, so what do you think is... Um, 
different about high school thrillers or, or teen thrillers versus adult thrillers? You know, what kind of sets it apart other than just obviously the age of the characters? Um, well, I think in general, one of the, the biggest differences is that the YA readership is so engaged and like perceptive, like I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this, but I almost feel that like with a YA thriller, they almost have to be twistier and more complicated than their adult count counterparts because the YA readership, which I mean, it's teens and young adults, but I mean, that's anywhere from like 14 to someone in their 80s, I'm not going to judge, but um, they just tend to be the kind of people who like pick up on the clues and will catch you out. So I feel like it, I'm just going to say it, it's harder being a YA author for crime thrillers than the adults, they get it off easy. I think, yeah, I think <laughs> you, you just have to be aware at all times that if you're trying to like pull the rug out from the reader, a lot of them are going to be smarter than you. So you've got to mm -hmm. be like, well, you're running like multiple narratives in your head of like, okay, some people will think this obvious theory, some people will think this less obvious theory, but this is the real thing. It's, it's quite complicated. You have to have like three books in your head at the same time. Um, but, but I think it's also like, the best readership to write for because I mean they're very passionate if they love something they'll tell you about it the flip side is that if they hate something they will also <laughs> let you know. I'll tell you <laughs> so sometimes interesting um but no I think it, it has its challenges but it's also really like a rewarding age group or just readership to write for because they're so engaged and like they want to shout about things and like show you their theories. I just think it's a really fun, it's kind of like just a massive book club and everyone's yeah. like, yeah. like ready to get involved. Unlike those boring adult readers, they don't. <laughs> just, what do you think, Natasha? Yeah, kind of the same. And I'm actually, um, to come back to what Holly said, when I'm writing, I'm like, okay, this is the killer. I'm like, no, maybe they'll think that maybe this person could be the killer. And I don't always know my own killer. <gasps> you don't. No. Okay. That was another one of my questions. Let's go there. So you don't. Sometimes you start and just you're going to wait and see how it goes. Yeah. I usually have the person I want to be the killer, but sometimes it changes. Mm hmm. What? How often does it change? Is it like 50 50? <laughs> Yeah, probably more often than it should, but. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I feel like I always need to know who it is. Um, but I will say that twice now, I've written six books, about halfway through, I changed my mind. Um, so it doesn't happen often, but it has happened. What about you, Holly? You're like, what? No, so I'm like, <laughs> what's going on? I Once I've like, decided and done the plan, it's not changing. Mm -hmm. There's too much effort for it to change, because like, I, think, I feel like if I got halfway and then changed it, I'd have to literally go back and like unpick everything. And I'm too lazy for that. So <laughs> even if there's a better solution, I'm not going to change. Once I've got to like, I've plotted it, I've planned it, I'm starting writing it. That's it. It's set in stone. Your killer's your killer. And there's, there's yeah, no, there's no, no deviating from that. No, no deviation from the plan because I'm too lazy. <laughs> so, so are you an outliner then? Are you pretty like meticulous plotter? With yeah. your books, yeah. yeah, like m really meticulous. I mean, there will be certain gaps. Like, for example, I was just writing the third book a few months ago, and I kind of got to a bit, and I was like, "Hey, I've just thought of like a," and I said, "A small little thing," but like it was something that wasn't in the plan. And I was like, "Yeah, that's good." Like, occasionally, those like little kernels of good ideas come as I'm writing, but mostly, I have the whole plot. I wrote um. I had a, a Word document with like my plot on it and it was 35,000 words, which is so much for a plan. And, wow. then I, and then I kind of write it out in key cards. So I have it like in order and I can shuffle if I need to. But yeah, I basically, it kind of tells me what happens in every chapter. So I know, I don't know how, I don't know how to do it any other way. Well, that's it. You know, if it works, then that's how you do it. And Natasha, for you, it's sometimes you follow the plan and sometimes you don't. <laughs> Yeah, I like to plan. I love to plan, actually. Um, and then by chapter three, I'm like, meh. <laughs> we'll do something else. <laughs> so let me ask you guys about your protagonists, because you both are featuring, you know, strong young women who find themselves caught up in these mysteries, but not by chance. You know, they are caught up partly because of choices they've made um, and just kind of like who they are as a person. So tell me a little bit about your main character and then Tasha, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, so I love strong female characters. 
and strong female teen characters. Um, so they all, they always need to be driven by something, you know, they, they want to fix a problem or solve something. Um, I love strong friendships as well. My main character they have like a really, really tight friendship with another girl. Um, I think it's important that we show that as well, you know, that women can be strong and tough and courageous. Yeah. And uh, Holly, what about you? Um, so my main character, actually, an interesting factoid here was she was based in the first book, not further in the series because things go off the deep end, but she was originally based on my boyfriend's little sister, who at the time, this was like a while ago, um, she was just so motivated and always doing homework. And we'd be like, just sit down and watch TV. And she'd be like, no, I've got work to do. And I was like, I cannot relate to this person. But I would, like, it kind of started percolating in my head, like someone who's like so motivated to always be doing something and doing work, like kind of if you married that with the idea of like someone trying to investigate a crime, they're this person who's so motivated to do homework what if you could like combine a project like a school project with like a murder investigation and like th that personality is kind of the reason why there's such forward drive and I, I need to find out what happened which is kind of where the book idea came from really and um beyond that like small initial idea she's not based on my boyfriend's little sister because that's probably <laughs> very flattering <laughs> right. but, um, I think it's important to me that um that Pip, she, she's kind of the one who's driving the events of the book. You know, she's sticking her nose in and kind of causing, like, um, dragging up, like, secrets from five years ago when everyone had thought everything was kind of settled. Um, and one of my, like, my main things that's, like, I feel like this is the hill I'm going to die on. I mean, you guys might have come up with this too. Um, a lot of the time, a lot of people will... will always comment that the main character of like a, a YA book, especially if they're a female main character, they can say, oh, they're unlikable. Even if like a male character chose to do the exact same thing, people would be like, oh, they're so brave. Oh, they're so thorny. Oh, it's great. Like if a woman or a teenage girl dare to do something adventurous or like be a bit sassy or just be a bit of an asshole, people are like, oh, she's unlikable. So I decided that like one of my main things was I was gonna write an unlikable character and I don't care if you like her or not, that's not the point. So she is a bit like abrasive at times. And I mean, you're not supposed to hate her, you're supposed to still like, relate to her on some level, but like, um, especially as the, the book series carries on, I, I feel like she gets more and more unlikable. So for me, it's a fun challenge to see if people really do find her unlikable or if, if I can kind of break that kind of like attitude that sometimes people have with female characters. Yeah, no, for sure. It very much is one of those standards where, you know, you've got the bad boy male character who everyone adores. Yeah, and like, uh, oh, your name. Yeah, name. I mean, I've written that guy and uh, people <laughs> love him. They will forget yeah. him anything you but if you were a girl people would be like oh he's a bit unlikable isn't he yeah yeah but Addie, on the other hand you know was deeply unlikable for the first half of one of us is lying and then people grew to like her but it, yeah. she at the beginning people did not like her i was like you don't need to it's okay mm -hmm. it's okay if you don't like her she's compelling Yes, very compelling. Keeps you turning pages. So yeah. you both did that. So the other thing I wanted to ask you about was, you know, you've you've got your main character, obviously they're teenagers, so there's a lot of important relationships in their life, um, people that they're interacting with throughout the story, like families, friends, romantic relationships. How was that, you know, sort of balancing all of that with moving your plot forward? How important is it to you to show sort of like that fullness of their life? And Holly, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I mean, you guys probably also can relate to this. Sometimes like the normal parts of the teenager life get in the way and you're like, oh, I wish I could just kill off these parents because they're obviously going to be concerned about their daughter and they're going to ask questions and that's going to ruin everything. So, I mean, I had the impulse a few times, but um, I actually just tried to kind of involve, Pip's got, um, she has her parents and a young brother. I just try to involve them as much as possible because 
it, the book does get quite dark. It, it covers some dark topics. And like, I wanted to find lightness and kind of like nice life moments where I could. And her family is kind of that like solid base. And you kind of see her start to like, kind of step away from that like security and, and obviously keeping secrets to herself. But um, it doesn't come without its challenges, certainly when you've got the premise of a girl like um, trying to investigate a murder, you're, I'm sure her mother would be like, no, you're not doing that. Right. <laughs> you're in a project on volcanoes and that is it. Five <laughs> minutes and it's over. <laughs> um, very you know, unrealistic see, parents. It is a delicate balance sometimes, but um, in my first book, it was it was something quite easy to overcome because her murder investigation was her school project, which is like she was trying to, well, in the American version, she's trying to get into early admission in Columbia. So she's got to cover herself in shine and stardom anyway. So she's got to do this project and she's got to do it well. So that was a way of kind of justifying it and her parents being like, okay, well, it, it is just a project. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it was challenging, but I think uh, those lighter moments are needed for all the murder. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and Pip's family is a lot of fun. I enjoy them. Yeah, I and enjoy Natasha. Her dad. Natasha, you were smart. You like got rid of the parents because oh, oh. right? oh. you're a <laughs> Oh, they're so irritating you because you you need them in there, but you don't want them in there. So, exactly. two of my books, like they're they're kidnapped, so the parents are like away from them anyway. And Perfect. yeah, just kidnap your characters because there's no. Oh. Um, no, don't have to worry about that yeah, one bit. No, but I think in the lake, yeah, obviously no parents are there at the um, the summer camp. But you need those lighter moments as well. Otherwise, it's just like it's too much. You know, you yeah. need to see them as people, and you know they're teenagers as well. They want to go and have fun, and and I think it makes those darker times really stand out more, like grab you because you like oh you like one minute you're like in a lake splashing around the next minute you're being chased and <laughs> yeah. it's not relentless you know there are those lighter moments okay. and i think sometimes i'm a contemporary writer first and a thriller writer second because i do like to show all those other aspects of life and oh then by the way you know the murder, <laughs> better solve it because our parents are paying no attention to us whatsoever <laughs> well those parents in ya you can't trust them you really can't yeah. right. So tell me, do you guys have, um, without spoilers, I guess, a favorite scene um, within your books, either that you just had a ton of fun writing or that you think readers will particularly enjoy or that you've already heard that they really enjoy? Natasha, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, so I like it kind of, we get until towards the end and there's like more action happening. And there's a scene where Esme sort of wakes up and she's been drugged and moved and she sort of wakes up and needs to get herself back to camp. And uh, I don't want to give anything away, but yeah, that was <laughs> <laughs> So you like writing the scary parts or the tense parts, right? Yeah. Like with everything you're building toward, now you can finally really yeah. put your character in that in that situation and have her have to get out. Yeah, I often write that first actually, before I write anything else. Do you really? <laughs> See, that's so funny. I I'll, I save that to the end, and half the time I don't know how I'm going to do it. You know, like whenever I tell my agent, I'm like, and then they get away. And I'll figure that out, you know, when that's a problem for future me. Yeah, that's future Karen's problem, not mine. <laughs> yeah. So that's an interesting strategy. I might need to try that because it's always a struggle for me. Holly, what about you? Yeah, I mean, those climaxy type scenes are really fun to write like the whole thing that everything's been building towards and if it's a mystery thriller kind of like the reveal is always a fun one to write at mine's a bit more boring mine so in both of these books i try to bring in like social media and kind of like tech that we use in our everyday lives and kind of turn them into crime solving tools so there's a, a part in the first book where Pip uses the Find Friends app on her phone to kind of turn her phone into a tracking device for reasons. And um, one of my favorite scenes in the second book, this is gonna sound really nerdy, um, and also a little bit spoilery, not too bad. Um, but I was, when I was brainstorming what kind of tech I could use in a really cool, like crimey way, I came up with the idea of someone having a Fitbit on that had tracked their steps, like their step count on the night they went missing and that we would find this data at some point and it would help in the investigating. 
Um, and because it was so complicated, because I had to work out, okay, how much distance does a human travel in one step? And I kind of had to do the maths and work out with my little fictional map. Okay, so he might have got from there to there. And then I actually drew a map. I don't know if I'll find it, just scrolling through. But I, I made a map where it kind of like tracked where the steps might have led the person with like kind of like a search zone. And um, just because it was so complicated and so much maths, which I hate, went into it. It was so like satisfying to finally finish the scene and be like, oh, finally. Because And it's not even like the standout scene, I'm sure. Like readers will probably skip past it and be like, that's a boring bit. But because it was so much work to get it in and try and get the tech to like seamlessly like work in with the, the plot, I was very pleased when I'd finished with that. Yeah, no, that was a good device. I, as a fellow mystery writer, I was like, yeah, Holly. Yeah, it's like to be good. And again, not to be too spoilery, but Fitbits also track heart rate, right? And yeah, so the heart suddenly accelerates for Wait. reasons, you would know that. <laughs> mm, very interesting point, Karen. I guess you'll have to buy Good Girl, Bad Blood and get to page 270. <laughs> I don't know what page is what I'm talking about. <laughs> I tried to make it seamless. <laughs> So we talked already a little bit about, you know, how you guys construct your mysteries. Um, and so one of the things I want to ask you is just sort of in terms of suspense, you know, like what are some of your tips, tricks, favorite ways of building suspense and just kind of hooking readers, you know, and ideally, right, you want them to get to the end of that chapter and not be able to put the book down. So what are some of the ways that you do that? And Holly, maybe we can start with you. I think this is probably something that we all strive to do as thriller writers. I know you do, Karen, in your books. It's this yeah. kind of case that you have to kind of in every chapter, you kind of want to leave a kind of little like cliffhanger at the end. It might not be like a huge major thing, but some like development in the story that then hopefully the reaction from the reader is, oh, just one more chapter because I need to find out what that relates to type reaction. So there is a way of like trying to structure your chapters so that each one can end with kind of like a reveal or a little like, oh no, what's going to happen? Um, which I think is one of those good devices for keeping people reading and hopefully reading way past their bedtime. Um, other than that, uh, it's quite difficult to like bury clues to your mystery because you, it's, it's complicated being a mystery thriller author because you kind of you don't want people to guess the ending but you don't want them to feel cheated that they haven't guessed the ending so you kind of have to tread that line between like giving them some really obvious clues but kind of burying it in between other things and red herrings and there's sometimes when I'm writing and I'm like this is so obvious I'm literally telling them what's going on like and it's only because I know what's happening that I pick up on it and hopefully I mean touch wood things so far I don't think a lot of people have guessed the ending I mean I'm sure they'll they'll tell me they have my mum pretended she had but she definitely didn't <laughs> um, but it's quite tricky to to kind of put yourself in a mind space where you don't know what's going on and trying to like bury clues for your reader so I don't know what the solution is but I'm just telling you there's a problem one of you fix it it is tricky. And especially, you know, when you're on like maybe the fourth, fifth you know, revision of your book, you yeah. know, it's so well, it all feels even more obvious. And yeah. like, I'm, I'm basically painting a picture for you people. Yeah, I'm literally this. pointing an arrow to who's doing <laughs> Bright neon lights. So, yeah. but then again, you know, no one else is probably studying our books like quite as much as we are, at least not we that many that. times. <laughs> so, <laughs> Natasha, what about you? Any yeah, tips? I think it's easier if you don't know what's going to happen in your book. This is oh. true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of a surprise when they come up for me as well. I'm writing, I'm like, oh yeah, I can go in there and this clue can go here, maybe. And I don't even know the killer, so I... <laughs> <laughs> so when you That's do that, right. when, when, you, when you surprise yourself, you know, in that manner and kind of, you know, go off in this organic direction, do you then go back and try to, like, plant clues that lead to that person or red herrings that go against that person? Or do you feel like what you put in place actually is pretty solid already? Yeah, no, I have to go back. Yeah, <laughs> that, was, that would be very impressive if you did not have. Yeah, you just did it perfect first go. No, I even know. Know. <laughs> yeah, like oh, oh, this is the killer, but no one knows this person for the whole twenty chapters. And like, okay, best revise. 
<laughs> yes. And it is, you know, it's that fine line between um, didn't see it coming um, and mm -hmm. feeling satisfied, right? Yeah. That, okay, yeah. I'm surprised, but it makes sense. Like, I think what that's ultimately the line that we're trying to yeah, you want them to be like annoyed at themselves that they didn't spot it because they should have. And now it's been explained to them. They're like, oh, it's so obvious. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically thriller writer nirvana right there. Exactly. <laughs> That's what we want. If that's what you could all give us, that would be perfect. Thanks. <laughs> So let me ask you guys, um, what is it? We've already talked a lot about writing young adult thrillers. What do you like most about this genre? Is it the the sense of surprise? Is it the twistiness? Is it the murder? Like, And do you think you'll stay within the genre or are you interested in exploring other areas? Natasha, you wanna start with you? Yeah. I, have... I, I think you already have written outside I have, yeah. Yeah, so a little bit of a different question for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love the murder. I love the readers. The YA readers are just amazing. Um, but yeah, I also write contemporary romance, and that's so different. <laughs> like, I can't kill all these people. They're not <laughs> many dead bodies. Hopefully. Not to judge. Sorry? Not as many dead bodies. No, unfortunately Probably. not. Mm. Holly, what about you? You think you'll ever step outside? Um, well, I, I think I will always write books that are like thrillers or like mystery thrillers in some format. I do love the YA um, readership. I think at some time I will try my hand at adult for a break. As I said, it must be easier than the YA. Um, but I think I really would like to at some point in my career kind of explore more like speculative elements as well in Ooh. kind of like a thriller mystery type story that kind of touches of like fantasy or sci-fi bits in it not too much not that you would classify it as like sci-fi or fantasy but just dabble yeah dabble. I would love to see that movie. from you that would, would be a very kind of like haunted house type vibe I would love to write one day so um yeah I think always thrillers or mysteries at some always like the kind of page turning plot heavy books but yeah maybe maybe dabbling in the aliens or the ghosts I would like to see that. <laughs> okay, I see a note that we have a lot of questions, so I wanna make sure we have time to get to those. But before we do, I just wanna ask you guys, what is next? What are you working on? What's coming out after your latest release? Cause we're all about what's next and why. Hey, you just had a book out in March, like, come on. <laughs> Holly, you've got one in like four months, right? <laughs> yeah, oh my God, I have a lot of time to churn these out. Um, yeah, so speaking of churning, I was working on the third and final book in the series, which is called As Good As Dead. And I think I think it will be out in the US in September, if I'm not wrong, I might be wrong. I, If I say it confidently, everyone will, will believe me. But um, yeah, I think it's coming out quite soon and I only finished writing it in literally just before Christmas. So I'm doing some quick quick edits on it and then uh, and then we'll push that out the door and I'll be done with this series and I'll be free. That's <laughs> wild, that's exciting. That is fast. Yeah. Who would have thought I'd write a trilogy? I didn't plan to write a trilogy. You, I mean, you wrote it as a standalone, right? Yeah, I did. And I did the same with One of Us is Lying and then it's like, oops, then, time for a sequel. Oops, <laughs> an accidental sequel, yeah. Now, oops, accidental trilogy. Um, yeah, I didn't plan to, but um, I've had fun doing it, but I do feel like I'm ready to to move on to different things. I'm a bit sick of you. Yeah. yeah. Natasha, what about you? You're also a very prolific writer, I know. So you've got you've got to have something. I have out soon as well. Yeah. The fear coming out spring next year. Um, doing the rewrites at the minute. That's one of the ones that the killer has changed. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep that in mind when I read it, and then I'm going to text you and see. If yeah. I'm guessing who it used to be. <laughs> awesome. Well, it sounds like we have a bunch of questions, so maybe McKenna can come back and um, let us know what they are. Yes, and um, some of the questions you have already touched on, I will say we have, I don't know, maybe 30 questions. We have a lot of questions. So, um, may, yeah, it's great. Maybe we can, um, some of them are going to be slightly repetitive, and um, some of them are for one person, and some of them are for everyone. So we'll just kind of knock them out. Um, I know that you've already talked about this a little bit, but in case someone came in late, 
how do you each approach outlining your novels? Um, and since Karen's been interviewing, why don't we start with you, Karen? Sure. So I tend to start with like a big idea that's like the breakfast club with murder. Um, but I don't necessarily know what that means. Um, so then I think about characters. I think about like who's in the room, you know, if, it, if it's detention and somebody dies and there's like five people, who are they? And I spend a lot of time thinking about characters and why they're in this situation and who they are and what they want. And when I feel like I know that, that's usually when I actually start thinking about the plot. And I use something called the beat sheet, you know, which is a screenwriting tool. Um, and I, I plot out like the big moments in the story, which hopefully I know. Um, and then when I have those plotted out, I, I get a little bit more granular and start trying to figure out, you know, how do I move from point A to point B to point C? And I would say my outline is very detailed for the first like three chapters or so, and then it's really loose and I keep going back and adding to it as I go. All right, how about you, Natasha? Oh, wow. Um, I don't do a whole lot of outlining. I know my characters, I know a general idea of what's gonna happen. I know the ending um, and then I just kind of wing it <laughs> and I hope. <laughs> And Holly. I'm number one fan of outlining here. So how long have you got? Um, <laughs> but I kind of, like Karen said, I think like a book, the way a book is born is kind of with that original kind of like concept. You're like, oh, what about this and this? Like the kind of like high concept kind of hook um, is kind of like the starting thing. So as Karen said, hers was Breakfast Club meets murder. Mine was kind of like school project meets murder. Um, and that, that's kind of like the question where like you, you start with. And then I essentially just kind of let myself get really excited about all the ideas and write them down in like notebooks or multiple notebooks for ideas, really just kind of spitballing ideas. A lot of the ideas are, are crap and will be cut and will not make it anywhere near the book. But it's just kind of that pure like creative stage you're like oh what if this could happen what if this could happen and like coming up with kind of cool scenes and set pieces and then kind of once I've done that kind of splurge stage I kind of have to like put it in some kind of order and I use um as Karen was saying as well I use quite a lot of like screenwriting terms and kind of ways of like shaping the story because I mean I think screenwriting re like they have to write succinctly and have to hit these certain beats and I think it can be really helpful for novel writers to look at some of their techniques and how they have like a midpoint and the three acts type thing so I start I know what kind of like emotional beats have to hit when so I start then sorting it into an order things might move around and then once I've done that I kind of like write out my key cards with every chapter like telling me okay this 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 happens and like how each chapter goes right until the end and then I like to say as I'm like collecting the key cards with more plot on them I go ah the plot thickens because it literally is thickening there are more cards <laughs> I managed to shoehorn that joke in there you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> perfect um while we're on you we have a question specific to you do you see yourself in any of the characters in A Good Girl's Guide to Murder? Yes, the murderer. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I don't know, a lot. I think um, a lot of the times with your main character, there's always gonna be bits of you in them or like kind of your attitudes or, or certain things that kind of creep in. I don't think Pip is anything like me. She's far more motivated and like if I had to start, investigating a murder and it turned out this complicated I think I'd give up I think I'd just put my PJs on and play PlayStation I don't think I'd persevere so she's definitely got her perseverance and motivation from somewhere else not her author parent um but um I I would like to be the kind of person that um investigates murder so in a way you might call her a little bit wish fulfillment but um no she's much cooler than I am unfortunately <laughs> okay now we have one specifically for Karen um, do you think you will write another one of us book? I get asked Go, a lot. Trilogy. Trilogy. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not opposed to the possibility because I do love the universe and I love the characters, but it would need to be the right story. And I have not hit upon that yet, partly because I've been very focused on getting my books five and six 
out in, not in the world, because neither of them are out yet, but out of my head <laughs> and onto the page. And I actually just turned in book six to my editor. So suddenly my mind is free to roam and, um, you know, we'll see what it comes up with. Excellent. Okay. Um, Molly was wondering, how do you come up with who the killer is? Is it random or very planned out? And let's start with Natasha. Yeah, random. Very random. <laughs> <laughs> I do plan it, I just don't always stick to that plan and sometimes you sort of get halfway through and you're like actually this person would make a brilliant killer and then you change. <laughs> oh I do. I feel like Holly is kicking and screaming with her outline. I know who the killer is from the, from the get go and it's not changing and I kind of start with the solution of the murder mystery so I kind of work out who did it, why, and then I kind of work back and work out how on earth is Pip gonna find these things out? Like, um, so I always start with that. So yeah, the killer is kind of, might not be the first thing, like as we were saying before, the kind of concept might come to me first, but then once I start working out the plot, I always start with the end and the killer and the why, and then kind of work back. So yeah, it's always, it's set in stone, unlike Natasha, who's just some kind of chaotic energy I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and you, Karen? I I usually know. Um, I would say the one time I didn't know at all was Two Can Keep a Secret, which I rewrote three times. And I like to tell people in that book, if everyone seems suspicious, it's because they probably did it at one <laughs> point because every draft had a different killer. And I think what kept like what was problematic in my first two drafts was that there wasn't, there just wasn't enough of a connection with the main characters. And so that's one of the things I think for me is important when I have like my villain, you know, I usually have sub antagonists, you know, people who are like at odds with the protagonist, but you know, not necessarily for, for deadly reasons, just they have their own goals and stakes and they might be in conflict with what my protagonists want. But then you've got this other person in the background who's sort of like the big bad and they don't have to be, you know, necessarily close to the protagonist, but there has to be enough of a tie that it's very meaningful. You know, the reveal is meaningful. And so that's sort of what wasn't working in that book was there just wasn't enough of a connection to, to have the impact I wanted it to have. So I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what are people gonna think when they finally realize like what happened? You know, what effect will that have on my protagonists? Sure. So we have you bridging the gap here, really. <laughs> a little bit of both. All right. Um, one in the middle of us yes, two yes. opposites. That's exactly. It, on, the, on the bridge. Hmm. Yes, exactly. And I know that we also kind of talked about this early in the talk, but um, maybe a quick recap. What drove you into writing thrillers? Um, and let's start with you, Holly. Um, I think, to be honest, it's it's the genre I was meant to be writing because it's the one I kind of enjoy reading and watching lots of Netflix about it and listening to true crime podcasts. So I don't know why I started with some other kind of different genre book. I don't know what past Holly was on about, but um, I, I think it's just what I enjoy, really. And I think one of like the most important things that I think as an author I need to try and remember even when I'm dying writing a draft is that I always want to write something that I would enjoy to read or would have as a teenager or would enjoy now and for me that is very naturally thrillers and kind of the page turning type books so yeah I think that's the reason the main reason that I kind of gravitate towards thrillers is it's because it's my kind of story and I'm a bit of a sicko I love like the darker a book gets oh I'm all into that so yeah I have found my home in thrillers and I, I'm very comfortable here. Um, Natasha I know again you write romance also but um, why thrillers right now? Yeah love it love murder love danger love fictional danger and murder and um, I love putting characters in danger and seeing how they're going to react and it's just fun. <laughs> Karen? Yeah, I'm sort of similar to Holly, you know, I didn't start out writing a thriller. The first book I ever wrote was a dystopian because I had just read The Hunger Games and I loved yeah. it and I didn't know anything about publishing. So I didn't know dystopian was dead because everyone was tired of it because there were so many <laughs> other books that were like The Hunger Games. So I just wrote another one and that went nowhere. And then I wrote a fantasy book because I was like, well, that's like, you know, 
that's very popular, young adult fantasy, but I'm not actually good at either of those things. Like world building is not my strength. Character is my strength and plot is my strength. And one of my critique partners asked me if I'd ever considered writing contemporary. And I was like, no. <laughs> but then I was driving to work. I had this idea for The Breakfast Club Meets Murder because I was listening to the theme song. And that just came together in a way that the other books had not. And again, like that was what I had always read as a kid. That's my go to genre. So I'm not sure why I didn't start there. Um, but that was the natural place for me to end up. So since you just mentioned what you read as a kid, we're going to move on to this one. What authors most inspire your work? And we're not talking about like contemporaries right now because that's the next question, but who inspires your work? So um, I'll call on someone, go ahead, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say definitely Suzanne Collins um, because I wouldn't be an author <laughs> if I hadn't read that series quite honestly. Um, and then on the mystery side, you know, Agatha Christie is kind of like the queen of the twisty plot. I read a ton of that when I was a kid and, you know, sort of absorbed it all. Um, and I loved Stephen King too. And I think again, for the characterization and the suspense and just like the nail biting aspect of his plots. How about you, Natasha? Uh, yeah, pretty much everything Karen just said. Um, I also remember the first time reading the Twilight books and binging them um, and then just reading everything I possibly could ever. <laughs> um, Holly. Yeah, I mean, yes, in the same way, Queen Suzanne Collins. I just, the Hunger Games is just untouchable. I don't know how it's so good. And um, I have this thing where when I'm editing, I don't, well, this is going to sound bad. I don't like to concentrate fully. I need like something on in the background. And I just constantly have the Hunger Games films just on a loop. Like literally yesterday, I just had, I, I got through three of them in one day and I just keep going back and watching them again. They're just so good. Um, and so I feel like I'm just like by osmosis, like some of the goodness will come out and slap me in the face while I'm editing. Um, so Suzanne Collins, and as Karen said, Stephen King, like I was reading Stephen King when I was way too young to be reading Stephen <laughs> King. Bad mothering mum. But um, I, I just think Stephen King, I mean, I'm not gonna say he's underrated because he's not, he's like the most famous. <laughs> <laughs> I think he gets a bit like, Stephen King gets a bit of stick for being like commercial and like not a good writer. He's an amazing writer. Like I, I can see like some of the like tactics he's got going in and just his writing style. He's He's the damn king, is what I'll say. That's why they put it in his name. And um, just his books, like he does thrillers, he does horrors. They, I, I just, I love him. Yeah, yes, agreed. Um, okay, do you have favorite authors you yourself like to read within your own subgenre? So YA mystery. Um, and let's change it up and start with Natasha. Yeah. I don't know. All right. Um, anyone else want to chime in here? <laughs> I've got um I just read a book by Tess Sharp called The Girls I've Been, which I think Karen, you've read it as well. Oh, it's so yeah. good. I had so much fun reading it like um I've been a, in a bit of a reading slump I, th I struggle to kind of read thrillers or things in my genre while I'm writing like in the thick of it um but I just read that and I just had so much fun I just loved everything about it like the plot the plot and kind of the the style they had like kind of list items in it and I love like nerdy little lists in books and things like that and it's just it's uh, the concept is um like three teenagers go into a bank and then the bank has two robbers in it who are trying to steal something from the vault and they are in like a hostage situation and it's just so like fun and fast but also like deep and heartbreaking it's great I think it's perfect <laughs> yeah I love that one too I also love um I think Kara Thomas is amazing. Everything she yes. writes is great. Maureen Johnson, um, Tiffany D. Jackson, and Courtney Summers are all mm -hmm. favorites of mine. Oh, yes, Courtney mm -hmm. Summers. How oh, <laughs> I love, I love Courtney she Summers. Is, yeah. She is another one who really influenced me when I first started thinking about switching to contemporary. I hadn't read that much in Young Adult, and Courtney was one of the first authors I read, and I read everything she'd ever written so quickly because it's just so compelling. Yeah, 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 excellent. She's amazing. Okay, 
So we have one specific to Holly. Have you ever made an actual murder board like the cover of a Good Guy Girl, Good Girl's Guide to Murder? Um, I have, but not not to solve a murder. I have made a murder board for a bookstagram to make a lovely photo of the summer. And then for my launch party for A Good Girl's Guide to Murder, I made a murder board as kind of like the centerpiece where I was murdered. Um, I was the victim with like my face crossed out in the middle and um, I had been beaten to death with a copy of my own book. That was the murder weapon. And then kind of I had uh, like all the suspects were the different guests at the party. So I had like the authors and my author friends were there with a little bio about why they might have killed me. And like my school friends and my family, why they might have killed me. I mean, so if I ever go mysteriously disappear, Someone go find that murder board. It's in my parents' house still. Um, and then look at all the reasons. I'm sure my murderer will be on there. It'll be one of those, I'm sure. <laughs> don't, trust, don't trust the people close by to you. It'll be one of them. <laughs> it is always someone close by. All right. Um, we have a couple questions about character development, character mapping. So I'm going to pop up this one by um, Jordan, but um, it's also basically your star violin. OK. What do you do for character mapping? Some of the characters are so complex and have such detailed stories. Um, Karen. Yeah, I spend a lot of time on characters. I do character worksheets, which is kind of like me interviewing my characters about everything about them. So it's, it's basic stuff, like what kind of clothes they wear and what's their favorite food. Some of it doesn't even make it into the book. But most importantly, it's, you know, what do they want? What do they need? Are those things like the same or are they in conflict with each other? And what are they afraid of? Um, and if I can answer those questions, I feel like I can send them on a compelling character journey. I also, because I write multi POV and it's really important to keep the voices distinct, I tend to do musical playlists for each character. And I listen to that when I'm writing them because it helps me get into their headspace and hopefully you know, bring out their voice. That's interesting. I'm sure that that helps a lot. Um, OK, Holly. Um, I don't think I really, uh, this is going to surprise everyone. Of how much planning <laughs> I don't think I do that much like in terms of character mapping. I mean, with my main character, kind of her main character arc is an integral part of the plot. So that one I have down and I know which point she has to be in at each point in each book in the series, yada, yada. But in terms of like the other characters, it's kind of the one of the things I don't really plan. I mean, I think I work it in my head what kind of people they are. And as Karen said, kind of their wants and needs, which are often like in conflict, uh, because that's how you kind of create the drama for the story. Um, but I think I just kind of let, that's like the one thing I don't control like a control freak. I just kind of let it come out naturally in the story when I'm kind of, writing dialogue like um my second main character is called Ravi and I didn't really plan what his character was going to be like I just kind of let him interact with like the pit character that I had already designed and he kind of naturally just his personality kind of filled out in the space that she left and like the, the way to get like perfect like chemistry between them so yeah the one thing I don't really do is the character mapping Woo, I'm a slacker <laughs> All right, Natasha. Well, I pull a holly on this one and I plan my characters very well. <laughs> so I need like lots of notes on, you know, not just what they physically look like, but what they want and need and um, how they will react. You know, some people are like fight or flight and that kind of thing. So I actually plan them. Well, <laughs> good job, Natasha. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's funny. Okay, um, for all three of you, what advice would you give to a new writer? And Natasha will come right back to you on this one. Yeah, uh, write for you, write what you want. Don't listen to people who say you can't do this or that. You know, um, read loads, write as much as you can. Um, yeah, just don't listen to negativity. All right, how about you, Karen? Yeah, I think that's excellent advice. I also um, tell new writers to, 
you know, just familiarize yourself with the business aspect of it, because even though it's very creative, there's a huge side of publishing that has to do with, you know, how you get contracts and how you get paid. Um, and if you're going to be traditionally published, a lot of that starts with your agent. And I know when I started, um, I didn't really know anything about literary agents and I would just query whomever, you know, if I saw them on Twitter, I would send them a query. Cause I was like, yeah, you're an agent. I got a book. Let's work together. <laughs> um, but not every agent is a good fit for you. You know, and it just kind of takes some time, maybe a little bit of research, kind of look at the end of a book, you know, if you really liked it and see who the author thanks, you know, see who they're working with and then look up that person and try and learn more about them. You know, there's, there's also subscriptions you can get, but you don't have to spend money to do this type of research. You know, you can look into who your favorite authors work with and just familiarize yourself with that side of things. Um, okay, and that leaves you, Holly. <laughs> I like both of those pieces of advice. It's basically, don't take no for an answer, and then if Karen, oh no, Karen's that side. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the business side. Um, I think for for mine, I'll go back to like the actual writing. Writing, I think um, something that I only kind of picked up recently ish is like studying screenwriting. I think has been mm. so useful for um, for writing like simplifying the process of like getting the book right like not first go but like better than it was before and that sounds really boring but it isn't boring there are loads of like youtube channels this is kind of how i got into it where they'll do like video essays on like breaking bad or like your favorite films like the dark knight and they kind of break it down and show you what the screenwriters are doing and which beats they've hit and like the three acts and how they work into like your favorite films and that's kind of how I started just watching video essays on like TVs and films I loved and kind of working out why I loved them and it's all these tricks that the screenwriters are doing um so if, if you're like struggling like to get your book to be pacey or whatever you're not feeling there's an emotional payoff I really think just like look to the world of screenwriters steal all their good ideas and then make a great book out of it perfect um okay so Holly, just a really quick question for you. How many other books are you planning to write about Pip? No more. <laughs> there are three. Three, and, and if that's it, I'm done. I'm, I'm tapping out. I mean, I'd love to keep churning them out, and my publishers have asked, but I said no. <laughs> I can't do it anymore. And I think sometimes it is, just go back to what Natasha said, it's about learning to say no sometimes. And you know how, like, Let's revisit um, all of our favorite TV show at some point, I'm sure, Lost. Lost was amazing, but did it drag on too far that it started to not make sense afterwards? Yes, I think it did. I think sometimes it's about knowing when it's right to end something for its like peak emotional impact. And for me, three books, is it works perfectly. Every The plot kind of works, everything ties together into it kind of tells one intertwined story, even though it's kind of three separate mysteries. And to do any more, I think would kind of like, it would wreck it. And that, that oh, your memory would only be of like the worst later books. So hopefully I'm ending strong on the third book. Um, but yeah, sorry, there will be no more. Apologies. Okay, question for Karen. What was it like being the one to lay the foundation for YA high school thrillers? The trail. I would love to take credit for that, but I, I I think the book did get a lot of attention, you know, at the time. Some of that is luck and timing, but there was a really good foundation already. I think thrillers have always been a you know staple of young adult, and there have been some great books um, that inspired me. Like We Were Liars, I think is one of the the big YA thrillers that's still huge, you know, that's uh, still very popular and and very relevant. So I think. You know, I'm, I'm really happy that my book got the attention that it did and maybe, you know, helped um, create the opportunity for even more thrillers to get out there. Um, but I definitely think, you know, I was I was on the shoulders of other writers who came before me. Well, that's a gracious answer. Um, take, take the credit, Karen. Go on. <laughs> um, OK, we have a couple questions that are similar. So one of them is, um, how do you uh, do you get writer's block? And if so, what do you fight? What do you I can't read apparently. What do you do to fight it? And then the next one that's kind of related is um, how do you get back in the chair each day if you're not feeling inspired? So um, let's start with you, Holly. 
Uh, writer's block, in terms of like when I'm writing the draft, I don't get yeah. stuck then because I've already planned it. So I, I physically can't get stuck because I know what's happening. But there are times where, especially like in books like this, when the plots are so complicated and they have to, like everything has to tie in together. I do get days where I'm like, well, I don't know how to fix that problem. Like, I know what the problem is. I don't have the solution. And honestly, I think the only kind of answer really is just to let it stew, just to give it time. And of it, uh, like I like to do, like when I'm in the research stage, I'll be like looking up a lot of true crime because it's kind of like what inspires me. That sounds to be a serial killer. <laughs> um, I just like researching the true crime. And um, oh wait, what was the question? Oh, right about <laughs> I literally got so off piece here. <laughs> Um, so when I'm planning and if I get stuck, I just, I think sometimes if you stop trying, the answer does come to you. Like, I can't say the number of like dog walks I've been on where I'm just kind of like thinking, looking at trees, then I'm like, oh, hold on a second. And then I need to get my phone out and quickly write in my notes app, like, oh, maybe this could happen. So it does happen, but to get unblocked, I really think the answer is just like reading, researching, and just kind of hoping and praying that the answer will come to you. What about you, Natasha? Yeah, um, I get it a lot, and I have to step away for a little while. And I watch the Gilmore Girls over, over and over, every single time. Um, and I think just not thinking about it for a little while, usually then you come back with fresh eyes and you maybe see something you didn't see before. And also, like, I don't want to give my advance back, so I need to get there and I need to do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing about this that um, so many of the times, especially readers forget, like, it's absolutely a business. So, like, you have a deadline for your book. So step away, go go for a walk. Maybe, um, you know, I hear, I hear writers say a lot that um, when they get stuff, often it's because their character isn't doing something true to their character, which I find fascinating because, you know, the character's, like, fictional right so you would think you would have control and then when they walk back and makes it make it more true to the character then that works I always find that fascinating anyway sorry to jump in above you Karen go ahead and what is what is your take for writer writer's block oh yeah I mean I definitely get it I I like to say I get two different kinds of ideas one is bolt of lightning ideas and one is like a seedling idea and if it's a bolt of lightning I sort of know the whole story almost at once you know like you, you gotta fill in some blanks but you know it those are so fun to write um, unfortunately, I've only had two of those. You know? <laughs> all my other books. Of lightning. It's, one of us is lying was a bolt of lightning, and the cousins was a bolt ah, of lightning. Oh, Everything right else was like little, you know, idea, and you have to nurture it and you have to water it, and then sometimes it sprouts in a direction you did not expect. Um, and what I find is, you know, I struggle when the emotional core of the story is not there. And it's really hard to explain what that is until you have it. But I know like with my sixth book, I was like, something's wrong, something's off. And I decided to try an experiment where I would um, write completely different main characters. And I tried, I put in these two characters from side characters from another book. I was like, maybe they should be in this book. And that didn't work. But that led me to two other main characters and they were the right characters. And as soon as I realized that the whole thing just kind of clicked into place. So sometimes it's just trying stuff, you know, when you know it's not working, just shake it up a little bit. Yeah. Um, okay, I am really sorry because I solicited a million questions from you guys and we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but we do have about 10 questions about the um, TV version of One of Us is Lying. Um, so I'd like to talk about that. I, I'm not going to put anyone's questions on the screen because I know kind of the variants. One of them is, will it be available in England? One of them is, when is it airing on Peacock? Um, one of them is just talk about it and then related, um, do Natasha and Holly have any TV movie stuff? So let's start with Karen. Tell us about one of us, one of us is lying TV. Okay. So I can tell you what I know. Um, I don't know the answers to all of those questions, <laughs> but, um, the production team is actually getting ready to fly to New Zealand where they are going to shoot because, you know, in our COVID world, New Zealand has done an amazing job of containing the virus. And so the production team is heading out this month. Um, the cast will follow soon after. They'll be shooting through the spring and the summer. Um, I've heard that 
there is hope it could air this year. Um, you know, I think lots of things would have to go right for that to happen again. We're in a different kind of world right now, but it's possible that it could air in Pe on Peacock um, in the fall. Um, I do not know the international distribution details yet. That is still being worked out. But as soon as I know, if people follow me on social media, I will definitely tell you because I know a lot of people want, want to know where they can watch it. Okay. Um, Natasha, how about you? Any interest in shows or movies? No, but I am totally open to it. <laughs> <laughs> how about you, Holly? Um, I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to say. I, the the TV rights have been optioned for A Good Girl's Guide to Murder, and um, I'm kind of in conversations with people about script and stuff and kind of spitballing ideas and helping with the pilot script. So nothing like concrete yet, and it, nothing may happen. You know, no broadcaster might not want it. So it's all up in the air at the moment, but I'm, I'm having fun pretending it might happen at some point. That's really fun. So, and if it ever does, I'll be a big brat because I'll just be like, well, I've got a TV show. So Karen, <laughs> indulging in the bratty behavior because I would just use it as an excuse for everything. Like, mm, can you put the dishwasher on? I can't, I've got a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the main reason I want it to happen, really, is so I can get out of horrible tasks. <laughs> yeah, I have not found it to work for that, oddly. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, okay, maybe I don't need one then. Not not for lack of trying. <laughs> I mean, I have really, I have really made an effort, but <laughs> my 14-year-old is not impressed. But he doesn't <laughs> oh. That's pretty funny. Okay, I think a good closing question um, is from Sierra. She was wondering, when you knew you wanted to be a writer? And let's start with you, Natasha. Um, I was writing for a while before I knew that I wanted to publish. Um, I never ever even considered publishing. It wasn't even a thought. I was just writing for a hobby, just for me, for fun. And then had this publisher like, oh yeah, well, we want to publish that. I'm like, okay. And <laughs> It was just crazy. So we went through that process and I'm like, yeah, this is all I want to do. Excellent. Holly. Um, I think the kind of loose answer is that I was probably always going to end up writing in some form because I was like the weird kid who used to like, oh, there's this example of like when kids were like playing on the playground, they'd come up to me and be like, we need a story for our game. Can you come up with it? So I'd be like a little story pimp and I'd be like, okay, there's maybe they've done this, uh, you need to get that. And they're like, okay, great. And then they'd go off and play without me. I, I was just there to <laughs> the game. Um, and then I think when I decided I really wanted to be a writer was when I was 15 and I wrote this like terrible, horrible, like fantasy, like Harry Potterish rip off book. Um, but I at least got to the end and kind of from then I was like, yeah, I think I want to be an author. So then I was like, I don't need to go to university. I'm going to be an author. And my mum was like, you are going to university. So that was fun. So it got put on hold for a while while I was learning, broadening my horizons. And then, yeah, after university, I did a master's. It was kind of the only thing I was trying. So I had part-time jobs on the side, but I was really just kind of like writing my first book and like querying so um thank god it panned out otherwise i'd have been screwed because i didn't have any other plans <laughs> all right karen your turn i was eight years old when i wrote my first book and i it was the only thing i ever wanted to be was an author but you know when i was older high school college i just sort of lost confidence in myself as a writer and I didn't really believe it was a career I could pursue. So I put it aside for many, many years, did lots of other things and like marketing and communications before I just came back to it for fun um, because I was bored and I thought it would be fun to write a book like The Hunger Games. Um, and here we are. So, you know, kind of going back to what Natasha had said earlier, it's like, you know, advice to writers, just, um, you know, don't, don't tell yourself no. <laughs> you know, let make other people do it. Um, put your put your work out there. You know, exchange it with other writers um, because you're probably better than you think. Well, on that note, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, 
thank you all three of you for um, doing this today. Special thanks to Karen for um, doing the interview. I know that it's actually uh, a good amount of work and obviously you're all three very familiar with your, your each other's works and I thought it was a great conversation. Very appreciative of it. Very appreciative of those of you watching. Thanks for the questions. Um, all the information about the books if you're not familiar with them, although judging from the comments, pretty sure you are. Um, if you're not familiar with the books, you can get more information at murderbooks.com. The link is in the comments. And I'm going to go ahead and sign us off. Everyone, have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.